consider the fact that we have two types of natural hazards. So we can annotate these on together. The first type of hazards that we would get are what we call geological hazards. So let me write that one on. So geological hazards are anything really that's caused by the land or sort of tectonic processes. Okay, so those would be things like your earthquakes. So let's pop that one on, there's a nice example. Type two of your hazards would be what we call your meteorological hazards. Okay, so therefore those are going to be things like, for example, um, your weather, your climate, so your tropical storms. Okay, so there's another nice example. So if you understand then that there are two different types of hazards, we also have factors that affect what we call hazard risk. So hazard risk is just a probability then that people may well be affected by a hazard. So the first thing that affects this is something called vulnerability. Let's write that one down. So vulnerability could be caused by things like having more people in a hazardous area. Well, that would put the population at higher risk, so therefore make them quite vulnerable to the hazard. The second thing we've got that might increase hazard risk here would be what we call capacity to cope. So capacity to cope, for example, could mean that more developed areas have better access to resources, so that lowers the risk for them, so therefore they have a greater capacity to cope. The third thing that's going to influence hazard risk would be the nature of a hazard. So nature of a hazard could be influenced by a few things. So that could be like the type of hazard. So is it an earthquake? Is it a volcanic eruption? The magnitude, so how big this hazard is. And also the frequency, so how often this hazard is occurring. Okay. So if we know then that we have two different types of hazard, we have three main factors. So let's highlight those, so our vulnerability, our capacity to cope and our nature of a hazard that will influence how great this risk is, then we can start to move on and think about exactly how some of these hazards are created. So if we start then by thinking about our tectonic plates. So this map here, beautifully on the screen, illustrates to us that we know that slabs of the Earth's crust then are floating on top of the mantle. Those are what we're calling our tectonic plates. So we sort of really have two different types of crust. So our first type of crust would be our continental. Our second type of crust would be our oceanic. So with our continental crust, it's typically thicker and less dense. Our oceanic crust is the opposite, so it'd be thinner and more dense. And our plate margins then, are places on this map, like where I'm highlighting here on the screen, where our two tectonic plates are meeting, okay? The red lines here, I appreciate, are a little bit faint, but again, they're just showing us the directions in which these plates are moving, okay? And that influences them, the different things that we see happening. So we sort of have two, three main types of plate margin then that you need to know for the exam. So the first type of plate margin that you need to know for the exam is your destructive plate margin. So a destructive plate margin, we've got plates that are moving towards each other. And what's happening here in the diagram if we check together is that we have one plate, our oceanic plate, so our denser plate here in this case, that's being forced down or subducted beneath that continental plate that we can see here. So as it's subducted, it's destroyed, which is creating us this lovely pool of magma here at the bottom. Okay. All that's then happening is our magma is rising towards the surface, where it's going to cool, it's going to condense, and that's what's going to form our volcanoes. We can get things like ocean trenches, that would occur in the area that I've just shown you on the screen there as well. Okay, but nice and simple movement here happening at our destructive plate boundaries. If you need to, just pause and rewind and you can listen to me explain that one again. Next then, if we move, let's have a little bit of a look at our constructive plate boundaries. So constructive plate boundaries work in the opposite way. So here we've got two different plates that are moving apart from each other. 
So as these plates move away from each other, well, the magma that's in the centre here is then going to start to rise to fill that gap. And as the magma rises to fill that gap, it's going to cool, it's going to solidify, and that's what's going to form us our new crust here. Okay, so a bit like the destructive one, if you need to pause it and rewind it, feel free to. So last but not least then, we move on to our conservative plate margin. So at our conservative plate margin here, there's sort of really two ways the plates can move. So they can either try and slide sideways past each other in opposite directions, or sometimes our plates are going in the same direction, but they're just moving at two different speeds. So when this happens, lots of friction is generated, and that's what causes us then to get our earthquakes. So with each of these hazards, we can really say, well, we get loads of effects from them. And when we're thinking about hazards, we like to sort of break down our effects really to sort of two categories. So our effects here, first of all, could be primary, or they could be secondary. So if we have primary effects, those are immediate things that happen after one of these hazards. So that could be something like deaths. So if I can put the E in there, there we go, death. That could be buildings destroyed. There we go. That could be things like damaged crops. So those are just three really nice, quick, easy examples. Okay, there are many, many more than that. And again, then if we flip that and start thinking about secondary, so these are the things that often happen later. So these are more of a consequence of our primary effects. So that could be other hazards. So for example, after an earthquake, we could get tsunamis. That could be things like disease from poor sanitation. Okay, that could be things like um, a weakened economy as a result of all of the damage to the infrastructure. Okay, and again, these are sort of really open to interpretation, aren't they? These are nice, quick things, hopefully, that you would think of in an exam. So if we zoom out then and look at the bigger picture, so far we've sort of covered really two thirds of the hazards. So we've thought a little bit about our types of hazards. We've thought about hazard risk, our plate margins and our effects. So as sort of with all effects, we need to think about how we would manage these going forward. So a bit like with our effects, you said, well, we'd call these primary or secondary. I think, again, you can categorise your management into two groups. So you could say your management then is either immediate. So if something is immediate, it happens straight away. So literally right before your hazard. And then we would have what we call our long term. So things that are ongoing then. So if we think about our immediate stuff, well, that's going to be things like evacuating. That'd be things like aid, which we'd hope would happen really quickly. Shelter. Things that would happen straight away then. But longer term, well, we might need to rehome people. So there would be one. We might need to improve hazard management. There's that one on there. We might need to restore supplies. So that could be things like fixing your water supplies, for example, afterwards. Okay. So we start to sort of fast forward a little bit then. The only real things we've now got left to cover is potentially then why people might want to continue living with this tectonic hazard. Okay. So if we sort of zoom out then, Let's go to the last little bit we're going to do on this side. So really, there's only a few reasons why people would sort of be quite happy to put up with this. So people that are living in areas vulnerable to tectonic hazards typically stay there then for a variety of reasons. So it could be things like they can't afford to move. So that could affect communities, for example, in LICs. It could be they're not aware of the risk. Especially, for example, if your volcano hasn't erupted in a long period of time. Some people might say, well, they've always been there. 
So for them, it's more of a way of life. And some people might think of the positives. So they might think, well, huge amounts of tourism. So that might be great. They might be employed there. They might think, well, the ash here makes the soil nice and fertile, which again supports their employment. So they may well choose to stay. Okay, and they rely a little bit here, don't they, on some of the management that we see happening. Okay, and I know we said, well, management can be like immediate or long term. We have sort of a few other strategies as well. But off the back of this living with hazards bit, we can add in. So things here, for example, like monitoring. So our monitoring and prediction. Okay, so that could be things like scientists monitoring things like the change in the shape of the volcano. That could be things like seismometers and lasers that are monitoring plate movements. We could put in things here like protection. So our protection might be things like well, strengthened roofs to cope with the ash, trenches to divert lava, for example, reinforcing our buildings with concrete. And then last but not least, I suppose as well, we can put in planning here too. So, well, what's planning going to look like? What's well, teaching people how to react if the hazard happens? Planning evacuation routes, emergency services, practicing their response procedures. Okay, And some of these things as well do overlap quite nicely into sort of atmospheric hazards too.